when I look at the political landscape and the economic landscape of the world, I really have a difficult time accepting that this is what life should be. We had so many concerns about education, technology, agriculture, Barbuda, health, the environment. You, you will be so surprised as to what they are engaged in. If we can do that, we can walk on that path, we will find a lot of solutions, we'll find a lot of adventures, we'll find a lot of answers. We need to foster that entrepreneurial spirit. No judgment, no negativity, all good vibes and conversations. All of this and more right here on Grassroots Radio. Hi everyone, welcome back to season two of Grassroots Radio. I'm your host, Jenny Bird. Here once again with another interview highlighting the positive side of life and youth culture right here in Antigua and Barbuda. This week's episode is a little different than what you guys have become accustomed to. Call it a mini-sode. It's a lot shorter, but I think it packs just as much impact as our longer episodes do. Whereas we usually speak with someone who is a little bit further along their career journey, Today we speak with Dorlisha Samuels, who is a young woman very much at the beginning of her journey. We talk a lot about her aspirations, becoming a teacher, being chief amongst them, and also her plans for opening a new home for girls in Antigua and Barbuda. I could say a lot of things about my impression of Dorlisha based on our very brief conversation, but as always, I think it's best to let her tell you who she is. My name is Doylisha Samuel. I am 23 years old. I am currently working towards opening a home for girls and becoming a teacher. Well, it all started from my mom and two other women who impacted my life positively. That is why the home will be named after them. It's called JMJ, Rays of Life Home for Girls. J standing for Jasmine, Marie, Jane. Um, Those three women, they basically, from a young age, from what I remember, their home has always been an open house for people who are in need. They always cared for persons who really needed the help. And growing up, seeing that... um, I can do nothing but help people who are in need, especially, you know, once I have it and I'm capable of giving it, um, I can do nothing but help others. I didn't grow up in a rich home, but it wasn't a poor home because we always had enough to give, which was, I always found very strange, you know, (laughs) and what we took for granted, what little we took for granted, um, the other person, the younger children that we invited into our home, they thought it was the world. And that really taught me that, you know, what some may take for granted or others take as a big deal. So that has pushed me towards, you know, giving no matter what, caring for people because you never really know what someone is going through. I always had nieces and nephews who were maybe just a year or two younger than I was. So we also always had to help each other. Um, But it got more seriously about four years ago, four or five years ago, um, where my niece, she had just gotten into high school. And as everyone says, that is a demanding school. So we wanted to make sure she was always up to par. And then I have a god brother he goes to the baptist academy school that is a very serious school so we also always wanted to make sure he was you know meeting the requirements of the school so i was trusted in dealing tutoring those two i wouldn't always want to have them inside in feeling like they were in a classroom so i would take them outside we would go under the tree we would go in the car anywhere that they felt comfortable And the neighbors saw me doing that and they asked, you know, can we bring our kids? And it turned from two to six to eight to 12 students. And I had this one case where one child, he was dyslexic. Well, he has dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was so bad where he didn't want to listen to his teachers, his parents, his sisters. 
um, he would only listen to me. I realized he had so many people shouting at him, not really taking the time to get to know him and learn about his his disability. So um, what I did, I would tutor him differently or separately, not always from the other students. I would take my time with him. I would tell him, you know, you're smart because he was, he is a very smart child, but you just had to take your time with him. Um, I had to tell him, you know, you're smart. You can do this. I motivated him. When he'd get something right, I'd take him out to treat him. I'd tell his parents, he did this really well all by himself while he was in the area, while he was there. So he can see that, yeah, I'm telling his parents that he did really good. And after a while, he got really, he progressed in his schoolwork. His grades started um, improving to the point right now, even though I'm not tutoring him, he's actually placing first, between first and third in his class. I know someone actually who has an older, sister, older sibling who was an A student throughout her entire life from kindergarten to um, university. Mm-hmm. And they feel as though their parents don't love them as much or appreciate them as much as they do the older sibling. Mm-hmm. And they now are pressured to having to meet the expectations of their parents because their, their sibling, their older sibling has set the bar so high that they feel pressured to always having to meet that. And I had to tell them, no, are you living your life for your parents? Or are you living your life for you? Yes, you must get an education, but make sure it is in the field that you want to be in. Make sure you end up getting, you get a job doing something that you love to do, not to get something as a manager because your parents think, okay, that is what you should get. And that is going to make me, look proud as a parent that is going to make me look good as a parent to show off to my uh, my neighbors or my other siblings oh this is what my child has done and this is what no you must live your life for you that is what I tell all my friends that is what I do you know I'm do what to make my mom happy but no I, I really hate the comparison thing um my mom used to do it uh-huh. um she used to tell us um look at what this our, our neighbor's child would do and I said okay do you want to be their mother or do you want to be my mother (laughs) you know tell me now (laughs) so you know I told her I would tell her no this is what I can do let's not categorize the students or the school let's just say we're going to help everyone to be better because currently because I went to a a government school I went to a public school and getting a hands-on experience to see that persons from the outside they more made contributions towards the private schools or Antigua Girls High or Grammar School and my fellow schoolmates we would all always wonder why are the are those schools always getting prizes and treats and why isn't anyone really giving anything to my school mm-hmm. and students at my in my classes they were smart we were doing well when we graduated the, in um, 2012 we actually brought back up the status of the school so we always were wondering why isn't anyone really you know giving us gifts and presents and helping to motivate us, you know. So it's not the school that is the problem. It's the students. And I once the teachers can learn how to be there to find out why is this child so aggressive? Why are they always sad? Why is this person choosing to always be by themselves? Why do this why does this child talk much in my class? Or, you know, this person might be an A student and then all of a sudden they bump down to getting 50s and 60s lower grades you know I think teachers need to try even even though it's not their responsibility take a step out of what is expected of you and do the unexpected and 
try to find out what that child is going through because you're going to benefit in the end. You're going to get good grades and then the, the system is going to see that, okay, this teacher, her class is, they're always doing well. So let's commend her. So you're going to profit in the end. I'm not looking for profit. I just want to know that I help the child. Once you have a good foundation, you can't go wrong from that. So once you teach students, toddlers, you know, what is actually needed in life, I think everything else would pretty much be set. They need to be happy. You need to do things that make you happy. You need to do things that you love to do, not what other people think that you need to do or you should be doing. So I think it starts with early childhood learning. Thank you for listening to this episode of Grassroots Radio. If you enjoyed the conversation, show some love and help spread the word. You can do that by subscribing on Apple, Google, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Already subscribed? Consider leaving a five-star review. It helps other people find the show. If you have an idea for someone you want to see featured or a topic you want us to cover, let us know. DM us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at grassrootsANU or email us at thenewgrassroots at gmail.com. For more about NGR, visit us at thenewgrassroots.com. Until next time, this is... Grassroots Radio.